Hello there, I'm Eugene Anangwe. Now, Ghanaian entrepreneur Fred Swanica has literally put his hands on almost everything that has to do with leadership development. Here in Africa, across the region, he has actually four institutions under his name that are actually aimed at improving or actually nurturing young leaders here in Africa. A few days ago, he did express his passion and concern for matters conservation. Under the African Leadership University, he did organize the very first ever Business of Conservation Forum that was held here in Rwanda. I had a chance to actually sit down with this son of Africa for a special edition of Captains of Industry. Take a look. Fred, thank you so much for making time to speak to us. Thank you very much for having me. Right. Of course, we understand you as a person who you know is much dedicated to matters education you have alu there and and today you're here through alu and other partners pushing a conversation and an agenda of con conservation and one wonders um, why would this be so important that it pulls someone like you to actually want to have this kind of conversation <laughs> Well, one of our beliefs at the African Leadership University and the African Leadership Group more broadly uh, is that uh, Africa needs to develop leaders who are going to be problem solvers. Mm -hmm. So we've identified uh, what we call the seven grand challenges of Africa. These are big problems that Africa has to solve, like urbanization, healthcare, education, climate change, youth unemployment, governance, um, and, and uh, infrastructure. Mm -hmm. right? So these are big issues that Africa needs to solve. But we also have another list of what we call the seven great opportunities. And these are the low-hanging fruit, things that we have been blessed with as a continent of mm -hmm. Africa, mm -hmm. where we have unusual competitive advantages, but we haven't captured them yet. On that list are things like agriculture, tourism, wildlife conservation, the management of our natural resources like our oil and gas and diamonds and so forth, the empowerment of women, regional integration and trade, mm -hmm. and arts and culture. Mm -hmm. So these are things where... You know, as we're trying to develop Africa, yeah. we shouldn't be just trying to copy the rest of the world. We need to see what are unique assets that only we as Africans have. Mm -hmm. And then how do we capitalize on those to drive economic development? Yeah. So conservation and of our wildlife, we see, is one of our greatest source of wealth. The rest of the world has killed all the animals. And we have uh, some of the last reserves of the most unique biodiversity in the world. Yeah. So we need to like, take a strategic approach to say, instead of just you know, looking at it as something that we should just be harvesting, let's look at it as an African asset. Because too many Africans don't see of, you know, wildlife as something that belongs to us. Mm -hmm. right? We experience it as something that's locked away for Western tourists to come and go on safari, sure. yeah. and we don't get the benefits of it. Mm -hmm. And that's the wrong way to look at it. Rwanda is a great example of a country that has taken a serious uh, look at its wildlife. Mountain gorillas are protected. Mm -hmm. I believe it brings about $400 million of revenue into this country. Uh, it's the number one earner of foreign exchange for Rwanda is through the conservation and tourism. So um, Botswana is another example. Kenya has a, you know, several billion dollars of its GDP comes from conservation tourism. Mm -hmm. So this is a serious business. This is not about just um, you know, uh, protecting wildlife for wildlife's sake. We need yeah. to think of it as how do we drive economic development through wildlife conservation. And that's why we, we are here to, in the last few days. Right. On the flip side, someone would argue and say, we seem to be changing tactic when it comes to matters conservation. Uh, we've, had con uh, con 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 we've had conversations with several people who have actually said that in the past, when we're talking conservation, we've always been looking at it from a humanity kind of perspective, a social kind of perspective, that if we don't conserve our environment, humanity will die out and so now we're seeing a change in that paradigm like a paradigm shift in how we think of conservation and we want us to think as, as, as look at it from a business point of yes, view yes. that money will come from this exactly. to actually sort exactly. you out then someone this, this conference is called the business of conservation for yes. that reason yes right? we want to say that in Africa poverty levels are, su are too high mm -hmm. for conservation to be for conservation's sake. Mm -hmm. it's too, that, we don't have that luxury. People need food in their belly, they need jobs. And so we need the only way we can align incentives so that people don't poach animals is for them to see that, oh, actually if I protect this and actually let this wildlife asset grow, 
I can get jobs, we can get income uh, from the tourism, from you know, the hunting or whatever happens around it. Yeah. So that it actually creates jobs and wealth for, for, um, for people living around protected areas. And that's the only way we can protect animals. Right. Is it because the previous way of thought on conservation has failed that we're now saying, let's now engage this next gear? Yes, I mean, most conservation efforts in Africa are not sustainable mm -hmm. because they only look at the interest of animals and not the interest of people. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, uh, unless you take into account the interest of people, you always fail in conservation because animals and wildlife knows how to take care of itself. You wouldn't even need conservation if human beings were not around. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so therefore, conservation is really about the interaction between nature and people. It's not only about nature. Mm -hmm. And uh, most conservation efforts to date have been focused too much only on nature and thinking about what's best for nature. And they've lost the plot. We need to think about how do you make it in the best interest of the people who are destroying that natural habitat, who are, you know, who are poaching and, and, and who are you know, really not making it possible for wildlife to grow, who are not making the right policies. Uh, you need to show them that actually it's in their interests. Um, and then once that uh, interest is there, we will see actually wildlife numbers growing. Right. There's another bigger challenge here is because, one, for families probably that um, you know, are having animal-human conflict, for instance, yeah. if we're now telling them that if you do not poach that animal, if you do not kill that animal, if you do not cut down those trees, if you conserve, then you will be able to get money out of it. There's now the bigger challenge, a bigger burden of actually keeping that promise mm -hmm. to these communities mm -hmm. that have constantly gotten some money yes. out of those bad activities of yes. poaching. Yes. So how do you ensure that this promise is kept and we're not having conflict? But this Africa? all comes down to leadership. Mm -hmm. Like everything in Africa, the number one problem we have is leadership. Mm -hmm. So if we want to address uh, challenges or capture the opportunities, we need to look at it from a leadership lens. We need to um, bring in the right leadership at the, at the political level, at the provincial level, in the, even the local community, right? Because often, um, if a, a scheme is developed where, for example, a community is supposed to benefit from proceeds from tourism, mm -hmm. but the chief is taking all the proceeds and, and, and spending it themselves, and they're not distributing it to the households, then you know, people will say, then what's in it for me? Mm -hmm. So it requires leadership. Similarly, at the national level, if uh, there are uh, receipts from tourism or other forms of income from uh, you know, conservation. For example, you might get carbon trading. You can get entire countries can be paid millions of dollars for conserving their forests. When that comes in and is paid to the central government, do they transfer some of that to the local communities that live near the forests who are actually the ones cutting it down? Mm -hmm. If that doesn't happen, the forests will continue to be cut down. Right. So it requires leadership. Um, and, uh, and once you have that leadership in place, you see that it actually works. Rwanda is a great example of that, it works. Right. And of course, you know, when you say this, um, the, on the flip side, you find the Mo Ibrahim Foundation just came out with a report on governance index mm. and the issue of citizen participation, the issue of the role of civil society organizations first, their voices are concerned, was one of the worrying issues over there. And for the governments or the leaderships to actually be effective, these two components are very key. Mm -hmm. Citizen participation, civil society organizations, voices being heard, very key. So if, if this, if we're to go by what Mo Ibrahim says, the Mo Ibrahim Foundation says, is it then all doom and gloom? No, I mean, uh, first of all, I think that the quality of leadership in Africa is getting better over mm -hmm. time. You know, it's, there's always two steps forward, one step back. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so uh, we do have much more democracy in Africa now than you know, 30 years ago. There's very few, much fewer conflicts, you know, 30, 40 years ago, coup d'etats were happening all the time. There are many civil wars. Many of those things have died down. Um, and there's a, a new generation of leaders that are better qualified. They've been educated, you know, um, and they are making better decisions. So the quality of leadership is getting better, but it's nowhere near where it should be. So that's the first thing. I think we, there is some hope for us, you know, in Africa in that regard. Um, but in order for our leaders to take it to the level that they need to, the citizens do need to actually put pressure on them, right? Because um, leadership is not just about position. Mm -hmm. It's about taking action, and it's about solving problems. And it's about doing things, not just for you, but for the people that you lead. And anyone can lead. So 
their grassroots leaders, their civil society leaders, their leaders in media, their leaders in technology, their leaders in science. It's not just about political leaders. Yeah. So citizens should demand more from their leaders. They should say, this is what, you know, if I voted for you, um, then, um, and if you, if you don't deliver, then ne next election I should vote for you, mm -hmm. right? They should speak up. They should ask for, um, they should put pressure on their leaders and then ask for what um, they, uh, what, what, you know, what, 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 uh, improvements they want to see in their lives. Right. If there are no roads in the community, then they should be asking the mayor, where, you know, where are the roads? So it's important that there's a, there's a partnership between citizens, civil society organizations, and government and so forth, mm -hmm. and, 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 and the private sector, where everyone is concerned about the, the well-being of the country, and everyone is aligned with a vision of let's work together to develop the, con the, the country. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and it's, it shouldn't be one of exploitation of mm -hmm. one versus the other. Right. Um, and, and if you have that active participation in, and not apathy, then we'll actually see uh, people behaving the right way. Right. But when we always complain about the leaders, we often forget that those leaders don't get themselves in those positions. Exactly. It is the, it's the people who put the them people there. Who yeah. actually put them there. Yeah. How then do we change this, um, uh, you know, way of? choosing our leaders because most of the time most of the elites in many cases they want to be on social media grumbling. well i think you know we um people who are educated and who have good ideas and who uh, have skills that should be helping governments to run better shouldn't just be sitting at home and saying you know we should get better leadership we'll get better leadership. they need to uh, be the change that they want to see mm -hmm. so they need to go and work for the government and bring their skills from the private sector and help the government to function more effectively but right now uh, the people who have the best talent in most countries in Africa uh, don't want to get involved in government. Mm -hmm. But if we don't attract the best talent into government, then we're going to be in this vicious cycle where government is not functioning as well as it should be. And people in the private sector are just complaining all the time. So we need to really come together as a partnership. Mm -hmm. And people who have the skills, the ideas, um, the innovation, the imagination to really make their countries better should go into government. Right. And just using your words. Would you personally go into government? <laughs> At the right time, I could consider it, yes. I mean, my, right now, I think I can serve a greater purpose by developing three million leaders for Africa mm -hmm. who are going to go into government. So I'm training high caliber professionals, and some of them are already starting to go into government. And I think that I can have a much bigger impact by developing millions of leaders over the next two, two decades who, you know, a good group of them will go into government. Some will run the central bank, they'll run the tax authority, they'll make sure we have uh, an effective police force, they'll make sure we have an effective judiciary. Mm -hmm. They will build the institutions that we need. Mm -hmm. Some of them will be political leaders as well. But by and large, I just hope we can produce high caliber civil service, technocrats, bureaucrats, as well as entrepreneurs, as well as leaders in science and technology and civil society leaders and so forth. So, I think the role that I can play at this stage is to really develop leaders who can go into government. I prove that's where the problem is. I mean, some people would be saying that we need him in there, probably as a <laughs> minister of finance, minister of youth, and now he's saying it's not the right time. So when is the right time? <laughs> well, I think we, we, we all have different roles that we can play, and, and it's about looking at impact. Yeah. And right now, if I can develop three million leaders for Africa, that is far more impactful than if I was to just serve for three to five years in one government today. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at a transformation for the, for the entire continent. 40% mm -hmm. of the world's population will be African by the end of the century. Mm -hmm. So we don't have a lot of time uh, to develop the leadership capacity that we need to, 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 to lead 40% of the world. Mm -hmm. And so um, I really believe that I would be doing a disservice to Africa if I stopped on my mission now to go and serve in one small government. Right. I need to really create this leadership capacity um, and, uh, and, 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 to, and to ensure that you know, we can develop a new generation of leaders who can move Africa forward. Right. But you're not denying that you received offers to serve <laughs> in government. I actually haven't received any offers. Many people have suggested I should go into government, but that's, uh, I, I prefer to be behind the scenes to develop uh, you know, talent that can then go into government. Right. <music>
we are seeing Africa growing, yes, but not at the pace that we all envision. And of course, it is actually being said that um, you know we need to actually grow at seven percent annually, or even more, if we are actually to meet the targets that we want to achieve as a continent when it comes to the economic growth. Mm -hmm. Apart from bad leadership that you con constantly always say that is one of the key problems that faces the continent, what else do you think needs to be straightened for the continent to grow? Well, first of all, I think we need to be measuring the right thing. We're measuring the wrong thing. GDP mm -hmm. growth is not what we should be looking at. Mm -hmm. We should be looking at employment growth, job creation. Africa has uh, a large youth population that is right now largely unemployed. And this is a big challenge that we should really come together as a continent to address. Um, by 2035, we're gonna have the largest workforce in the world, larger than China or India's workforce. Um, and if you convert that timeline into days, it's less than 6,000 days from now. Mm -hmm. It's not a lot of time. Mm -hmm. So we should be tracking how well are we doing to develop jobs for our people. Because sometimes, GDP growth, even if you get that 7%, you get that 10%. Yes. If it's coming from things like um, oil and gas or m minerals, then the GDP is growing, but jobs are not being created. Mm -hmm. And so we're not solving you know, really the biggest problem that we have in our hands, which is do people have income to put food on the table? For the, can they educate their children? Can they pay their rent for their house and so forth? So we need to really look at job creation. Um, and job creation for the next 100 to 200 million jobs that we need in Africa, the number one issue that we need to fix is leadership. Mm -hmm. I don't, we don't even need to go beyond that because countries just need to make, there are simple choices that leaders need to make that don't, doesn't even require foreign aid. For example, you will make it easy for foreign investors to come into your country. You, they, you will not put obstacle after obstacle in front of them when they want to come and invest in your country. Mm -hmm. That's just a decision a leader needs to make. Mm -hmm. You will remove visas to allow tourists to come into your country and, and business leaders to come into your country. That's just a decision you have to make. It doesn't cost you any money. Mm -hmm. You will not steal money when it is given to you by you know, foreign investors or, or donors. You'll channel it to where it needs to go. Mm -hmm. You'll provide security and, uh, and, and rule of law so that investors can have peace of mind. And you know, once that happens, you will see the ingenuity of your people coming to rise. The entrepreneurs will rise. Yeah. Investors will come in. Yeah. The jobs will be created. Right. So at the end of the day, developing Africa is not rocket science. But friend, it sounds it's, so it's simple. It's not rocket science. I'm it is. Some people say it's, 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 it's a sim so simple, as easier said than done. Then why haven't we been able to because achieve this? Because leaders that we have, by and, and, and large, are trying to serve themselves and not serve the interests of their people. Mm -hmm. I believe that job government really has three purposes that they should serve. Number one, they need to set the rules. Number two, they need to enforce the rules. And then number three, they need to get out of the way. Mm -hmm. Those are easy things to do. It doesn't require capital. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it doesn't require foreign aid. Yeah. Just set the rules, enforce the rules. Enforce the rules means things like being efficient with tax collection. We right now are terrible with tax collection across Africa. There's so many tax evasion, so much tax evasion, and we are meanwhile trying to get donations, you know, foreign donors to, to fund our, our national uh, you know, budget. Whereas we, we just need to get more effective at collecting taxes locally, you know, and we need to ensure that there's no corruption because that's all leakage that could be going to development and building schools and roads and, and things that our citizens need. Mm -hmm. And then after that, you just need to get out of the way. Yeah. Don't put obstacles for entrepreneurs who want to build businesses. Mm -hmm. Don't create, you know, make it, you know, in some countries in Africa, it takes you six months to raise that company. Why? In Rwanda, it takes you three hours. <laughs> it's just a decision. Yeah. It's a decision. <laughs> so, so, you know, the same thing with conservation, same thing with all these opportunities that we have in Africa. Yeah. We just need to decide. Right. You mentioned the word corruption, and what comes to mind is a sad story as far as a report by the Transparency International uh, you know, perception, Corruption Perception Disease is concerned. What they say is that 12 out of the 20 most corrupt countries in the world are from Africa. Mm. And so how does Africa shake off this bad tag of a corrupt continent, the continent where corruption is strife. Well, How? by doing things differently, I mean, you know, we need to create more transparency, open up your budget, show the citizens what, you know, is coming in and, and what's being spent on and, you know, create institutions that make it difficult for anyone to be corrupt. Mm -hmm. You know, so um, that's, that's one thing. And of course, it just requires political will from the top. 
um, you know, if uh, leaders are, are, are seen to be to have zero tolerance for color, co corruption, then they actually enforce that. Soon people will fall in line. There are countries in Africa which have very low corruption. You know, some of the least corrupt countries in Africa are also in Africa. Mm -hmm. Sorry, some of the least corrupt countries in the world are also in Africa. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's important that we not only look at those bottom 12 mm -hmm. that are supposedly from the, the most corrupt. Let's also look at the top 12 mm -hmm. from Africa and they will rank in some of the least corrupt countries in the whole world. Mm -hmm. So corruption, while it's a problem, I don't want us to, to say that it's an African problem mm -hmm. only, because mm -hmm. there's corruption in Asia, there's corruption in Europe, there's corruption in the US. Mm -hmm. And the only issue is that um, we need to ensure that we can de develop despite corruption. I don't want us to you know, wait until we have stopped all corruption in Africa. We need to get going, we need to create jobs. And let's not only focus on those countries that are uh, you know, supposedly corrupt by Transparency International, but look at also at some great countries in, but in Africa that don't have high levels of corruption. Right. I want to turn you back uh, on one thing that is uh, very close to your heart, and that is education, mm -hmm. before I let you go. Um, the issue of decolonization of yes. our education system yes. uh, in Africa. Most of the time you go to a school and what people are being taught is mostly what uh, is, is, is based on what is, is, is from the colon, colonial times. Mm -hmm. I want to read your thoughts on how African education systems can be decolonized so that it is context-based, it is realistic on what is happening within our African country's context because that has been one of the challenges that most students are facing out here. Uh, you're in school and you're being taught uh, history but it's history based on uh, scholars or people who are from you know uh, colonial countries while in your own country you have great people not just in your country but also as a continent in Africa who you're never taught about I mean how is Alu changing this kind of uh, way of doing things well first of all we um, we select students who are passionate about Africa. That's one of our selection criteria. We're looking for people who are passionate about Africa. But as I mentioned earlier as well, we have oriented our curriculum around solving Africa's problems and capturing its opportunities. So we've come up with a list of the seven big challenges that Africa faces and seven great opportunities. And we say, our, we ask our students not to declare an academic major, but rather to declare a mission. How are they going to use their education to solve Africa's problems? So from the inception, you orient them to really think about what are the needs of our people, what are the needs of the leader, of the citizens that I'm supposed to serve as a leader. You know, so go out into your community, understand the challenges that, are, that we are facing, contextualize uh, the issues, and then build your knowledge base around solving those problems or capturing those opportunities. So it's very focused around uh, starting with the problems that you want to solve, the African problems that you want to solve, and then building your knowledge base around it instead of just getting all facts and figures mm -hmm. and history, which has no relevance to, to your life. Mm -hmm. um, so, but it's very important that we also, as we talk about education and decolonizing education, I don't want to, I think, to us to, to naively think that there's nothing we can learn from the rest of the world. We, there's no need for us to reinvent the wheel. There, if someone has fi figured out how to you know, kill malaria, I, you know, I don't care if you're Chinese or Indian, I will take it and apply it here because we need to save lives today. You know, so we need to look at technologies and knowledge and you know um, uh, best best practices that you see in other parts of the world, and then we must copy the ones that we think are relevant, mm -hmm. and ignore the ones that are not relevant, yeah. and then create our own solutions that have not been developed anywhere else, right. where a foreign solution doesn't work in Africa. So we need imagination, we need creativity. Uh, it starts from understanding Africa's challenges and opportunities, and then look everywhere, whether it's in Africa or outside of Africa, to find the solutions, um, but contextualize it as you apply it to solve Africa's problems. Right. Finally, mm -hmm. while you're not thinking about doing what you want to do, or think about the African Leadership University, what is it that you do uh, on, on, mm -hmm. on, on a personal level? And then also, how do you remain consistent? You know, how do you remain grounded? to your goals, to your dreams, to the ambitions that you have? Because I'm sure for some people who are watching us right now, that is not an easy task to do. <laughs> well, I, I think one thing that grinds me is just the, the sheer 
enormity of the task that we're on. Um, it's a, you know we've got it's a long term goal. It's a thirty to fifty year project, and so um, when you look ahead of all the things that we still need to do, um, it's very easy to remain humble <laughs> because you're like I haven't accomplished much. <laughs> you know, uh, there's still so much to do, and I just need to stay focused and keep working. Yeah. So that's very easy for me to stay grounded because I'm, I'm always looking at the goal and the goal is very far from being achieved. So I haven't arrived yet. There's still a lot of work to be done. Mm -hmm. And so that keeps me very focused and just continuing to, to do the work. Mm -hmm. uh, and the minute you think you've arrived, then you stop growing as a leader. Mm -hmm. So in my mind, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's just all about realizing that there's still a lot more to do and to just uh, remain focused and, and, and keep doing that work. And what what um, you know, and it's also important that you that uh, as a leader you have staying power. So you have to take time to rest, mm -hmm. get good sleep. Mm -hmm. So you ask me what I'm doing when yeah. I'm not. I make sure I try and get good sleep. Yeah. Um, try and uh, you know spend time with my family, um, and uh, you know have a, uh, just relax in the in the on a Friday evening with the, and watch Netflix and, and and just take a break. You know, it's yeah. very important. You know, go on vacation yeah. and. Uh, Taking, it's very important that you take time to rest and relax because as a leader, when you are stressed and you're not taking time to think, then you make bad decisions. Mm -hmm. And so uh, um, I don't look at vacation as um, something that's taking me away from work. It's actually enhancing my work because it brings me back more energized and it allows me to reflect when I'm you know, on, on, on vacation somewhere and come up with some of my best ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, so, it's actually an integral part of being a leader is being able to take care of yourself. Well, that's it for this edition of Captains of Industry. Catch the next edition right here on CNBC Africa, where we are fast in business worldwide. As always, I'm Eugene Anangwe. Goodbye for now.